Before we dive into chapter 14, just a quick reminder, last week we covered John chapter 13, which was the beginning of the Last Supper in the upper room. And if you look at this from a, from a big perspective, from a bird's eye view, you have 13 and 14 in the upper room, then at the end of 14 he tells them, arise, let us go hence. Now they start walking through the city and then up the Kidron Valley as he discourses to them on various subjects. In verse chapters 15 and 16, you get to the top of the Kidron Valley, and before entering into Gethsemane, he pauses there in chapter 17 and gives the great high priestly or intercessory prayer in chapter 17. What I wanted to point out here is if you do some simple math and count this up, you have 13 through 17, five chapters all take place within a few hours of time in a 33-year 33 33 life of the Savior Jesus Christ. Five chapters out of John's total 21. We're, we're right in the neighborhood of one-fourth of his entire gospel, of everything John, who is in the Savior's inner circle, everything he could have taught us, he's putting significant emphasis on this few hours of experience with Jesus right before going into Gethsemane. And then if you add chapter 18, which is John's account of Gethsemane, and 19, his account of the, the trials and, and the crucifixion of Christ, if you add that to the mix, you're adding a few more hours of time now you're at seven out of 21 of John's chapters. That's one-third of the entire Gospel of John is taken up from the evening of Thursday when he goes into the Last Supper through early in the morning on Friday of the crucifixion, uh, just over a 12-hour uh, segment of Jesus' life, and we've got one-third of the time spent. So, I only pointed that out because I think we're going to see as we dive in that some of the greatest truths, some of the biggest theology that Jesus is going to share in his ministry comes at such a critical time when he's literally moments away from beginning his infinite uh, atoning sacrifice, beginning in Gethsemane. So as we move into chapter 14 of John, we're concluding this last supper that Jesus has had, and right here in verse 34 of John 13, he says, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Tyler has pointed out that Jesus is about to go engage in the most loving act of his entire life, and in the process of getting there, he is teaching how to experience and share love and how to know what love is and what truth is. It's very, it's so amazing. It's, it's incredible when you put it in that context and, and you look at how much time and energy and effort Jesus is putting into strengthening and buoying up his apostles at this late hour of his life when, I don't know about you, but, but when a, a huge deadline or a huge event that's going to be scary is looming, I'm, I'm not really focused on how other people are doing and how they're feeling and how I can strengthen them. I'm focused on me figuring out how I'm going to get through this, this big, terrible, or difficult event. Not Jesus. Look at verse 1 of chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. I think there's more there than just, oh, don't, don't be afraid, don't be troubled. I think Jesus is preaching something that he's practicing. I think he's found ways, being the Son of God, to himself not be troubled in that moment when everything in his physical mortal being would be pleading with him to be troubled, and he's not allowing his heart to be troubled at that moment. I really love this word believe because of well, several core reasons. One, 
its etymology in English comes from two ancient words, be, leave. So this actually is a derivation from the word love. Notice how we talked about Jesus is trying to show and teach love. And when he asks people to believe, one of the essences of that meaning of the word is about love. And B means 100%. So when we believe God, we show that we are 100% love him. We want to be in a loving relationship. As we also consider the expansive covenantal context of the word believe, it means to be in a faithful, loyal, fidelity relationship. So when he says, believe in me, he's encouraging him to think about how he and his father have been covenantally loyal and faithful to all of God's people for all time and eternity. And, there's, and Jesus is now saying, be like us. We have been loyal to you. We have shown you loved. We've believed in you. We have loved you. Do the same. If you believe in me and join this loving relationship, you will have eternal love. And really, this is the essence of the gospel. It's love. Isn't it fascinating that, that we live in a world that's, that's providing us all kinds of causes, all kinds of doctrines and teachings, and encouraging us to believe them? Well, stop and think about it. If you believe an untruth, you now put your love and your focus and your time and your energy and your talent and your goals and your, your future vision in a direction that, that isn't going to deliver, it's not going to produce, whereas Jesus says, and believe also in me. It's put your love, put your focus 100% on me, trust me, believe in me, and then that will cause us to act in ways that would help us to become like him. Such a powerful concept here. And then verse 2, he goes on to say, in my father's house are many mansions. Joseph Smith would use the word kingdoms. This verse, this concept is one that helped plant a seed in the mind of a prophet to begin thinking through and asking questions that would eventually lead to the revelation given in Doctrine and Covenants section 76 with the degrees of glory. That idea that it isn't just heaven or hell, and there's this dividing line between the lowest person in heaven and the highest person in hell where one sin separated them and wow, it sure it's rough to be that, that guy that ended up in hell. It's that idea of, no, there are many kingdoms, many mansions that, depending on how we choose to live our life, will determine the kind of mansion, the kind of kingdom we end up in, tied into that incredible talk by President Russell M. Nelson called Choices for Eternity, that, that we, to a large degree, determine these, these kingdoms that, that uh, we're going to inherit one day through the grace and the merits and the mercy of Jesus Christ. The underlying Greek word conveys that essence. The underlying Greek word is uh, meno, in fact our word mansion comes from that word, but it literally means to remain or abide. Think about that song we sing, Abide With Me, where we invite Jesus to remain with us. So when Jesus says there's many places where you could remain, well, if you choose to progress to a certain point and then stop and say, I'm remaining here, there are many mansions in the Father's house, and God will absolutely protect your agency. If you choose to only get to this spot and remain there and abide there, he will, he will honor that. But if you want to go further and go further along the way of following Jesus and believing in him more, showing even more love and faithfulness, you will go farther and further into remaining in his presence. So he continues by saying, if it were not so, if I didn't have many mansions, many kingdoms, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there ye may be also. Pretty powerful uh, promise. And whither I go, ye know not. So this word receive, the underlying Greek word, also comes from the word of to take. So when you take something, you it's an agentive action where you're doing something to acquire something. 
this idea of receive has in its essence that Jesus is proactively doing something to receive you. It's not him passively just sitting around and like, oh, look at these people who showed up in my mansion. He is proactively taking you, not to uh, overstep the boundaries of your agency, but he does everything in his power to bring you along. So this idea of we're talking about mansions, we're talking about kingdoms, keep in mind that in a gospel context, often we put all of our eggs or most of our eggs in the destination basket, this, this end goal. I, I want to go to heaven, I want to get to one of these kingdoms or to this, this mansion on high. The reality is, is that there are incredible experiences and incredible truths to be found, discovered, and enjoyed along the way, the journey versus that ultimate destination. And look at his wording here, verse 4, whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. And that's when Thomas asked him the question, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? We, you're talking as if we understand what you're saying, and we don't yet get what is the way. And I love the Savior's response. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The journey, the way, the path is Christ. The destination is Christ who then turns you to the Father. It's he is in and of and through this entire process as well as the destination. So the base meaning of, of jur is the word day. Every day matters. I get it. Some days are worse than others, and some days we're like, I can't wait for this day or week or month or year to end. The intention here is that every day we can experience the love of God. Every day we can love him back and love those around us. In the midst of suffering and trials and challenges, we can choose love. That is the way, as Jesus points out. And this is what we're going to see here in the next chapter or two, Jesus really honing in on how can you know or see the way that on a day-by-day -day basis you can be in that loving covenantal relationship with God and feel joy. So look at the three words that Jesus uses here. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Think about the significance of him using this, this uh, precursor, I am, ego a me, this, this identity um, forming phrase, I am, it, it, he's revealing his soul, his characteristics, his perfections, his attributes to us, and here we get three of them. I am the way. Don't think of a path. Think of me. Just do the things you've seen me do. I am the way. I am the truth. He, he exudes truth. He embodies truth. He is the truth. Think about Father Lehi's dream in 1 Nephi chapter 8. He had the straight and narrow path. There was a rod of iron, and then there was a tree, and the tree was called the tree of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Everything in the gospel of Jesus Christ brings us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every step, I can't go any step forward in a direction that really matters, that's progression, without him. I can't define my own truth. I can't come up with my own realities. I have to find his truth and hold to it, hold fast, continually pressing forward, holding on to him, not just a, a rod of, of metal, a rod of iron. It's holding on to him that then helps me progress and move forward and back to our discussion of believe, which now brings me to him as the representation of the tree of life where I now 
I'm given that opportunity to partake of the fruit of eternal life, which is the greatest of all of the gifts of God, from Doctrine and Covenants, section 14, verse 7. Powerful concepts here, all of which are focusing us and his apostles at that very late hour of his life on him as their saving redeemer, because there's no other path that leads to the Father. So let's dwell just a bit more on the, this question from Thomas, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus had said, verse 4, I, whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. And then we see the way, the truth, and the life. So there's a fancy word that is used in the field of learning called epistemology. Now, I don't think it's going to show up on the final exam to get into the pearly gates, but this word essentially means the study of how we know. And these chapters here teach us how to be, how to acquire, or see, acquire, and be grounded in truth so we can know Jesus and know his love. So this chapter is about knowing and doing, and Jesus tries to demonstrate these things. So there's a couple of really interesting words. We talk about um, the way. In fact, uh, it, it's interesting, we have this word, method, and the latter part of this word means way or path. We talked about Jesus being the way, and the meta means to follow or what goes after. In fact, just as a little aside, one of the great ancient Greek scientists was a man named Aristotle. His teacher had been Plato, and Plato had, his teacher was Socrates. Aristotle was a great systematizer of knowledge, and he wrote a book about nature, everything you might find in nature, and the Greek word for nature is physics, so he wrote a book called Physics. Well, then he wanted to write a book about things that aren't found in physical nature. Maybe they're up in the heavens or in the ether or spiritual, and he didn't know what to call the book. So he literally called it the book that follows the book on physics, or metaphysics. So if you ever hear people talk about metaphysics, that's where it comes from. The book that follows after the book on physics, or the things that are in nature, or physical or tangible. Where we're going with this is, if you want to know something, you have to follow a path to get there. Imagine you're on a hike and with a friend, and you take separate directions up a mountain, and your friend gets to one overlook, and you get to another, and then you come back and share with each other your perspective of what you saw. Now, you might be looking at the same scene, but from different angles, and so you're going to have a different experience or a different set of knowledge about the same thing. Now, imagine that you get to, to the bottom of a mountain, and you meet a stranger who starts explaining what they know or what they see, but they can't tell you the path or the way that they got to where they know something. And Jesus wants us to be clear about what truth is and how to get there. We can use this in our world today. We have a world full of lots of ideas, and in some cases, a lot of confusion and misinformation. And it's important for everybody that we can document and our, or identify the path that we followed, the method we used, to gain our knowledge or our insight. If you can't explain to somebody or to yourself how you got to where you're at and why you see things the way you do, nobody else can follow that path and get to that same knowledge. Furthermore, if you have somebody trying to convince you of something and they also cannot share a method with you that's repeatable and visible and useful for you to also follow that path and to see how they see things, it'll be very difficult for you to share or participate in their knowledge. So let's tie this in to the epistemology or the methods of God. What is our epistemology for how we know truth? And I learned this from a friend yesterday. Her name is Joan Boren, and she shared this really powerful scripture with me that I've read a lot of times, but I never realized it was teaching about epistemology, about how to know all truth. And listen to what Nephi says. Now, we've been talking about life, the tree of life, that's 1 Nephi chapter 8, 
Nephi then wants to have his own experience. He wants to follow the path that his dad has followed and see as his dad has seen. So he also has a vision of the tree of life. And the angel is working with Nephi to know things. And he asks Nephi a question, and Nephi says this, I know that God loveth his children. Nevertheless, I do not know the meaning of all things. Wow, that's powerful. Nephi's epistemology, or the foundation for what he knows, is grounded in the love of God. Nephi recognizes, I don't know everything, but if I start with the love of God, that I do know, and from that I can build into knowing anything else. Think about how this connects here. This is exactly what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples. Love. Love one another. This is how you demonstrate the method or the path for people to know God, that they too can also see his love. We should tie this into the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon, the title likely means in ancient Egyptian, the book of God's love endures forever. So in your life, if you want to know more and see more truth, perhaps we could follow the method of Nephi by being grounded first in the epistemology or in the foundation of knowing that God loves his children and I can be secure in that truth and that truth will then allow me to have the experience with all other truth that is good, lovely, praiseworthy, and of good report. As we move forward into the chapter, some of the things you might look for are words about knowing, seeing, loving, truth, and there's a lot of these words that show up in this chapter, and it's interesting that Jesus uses words like, I'm going to manifest, or I'm going to show, or I'm going to teach, and all these have to do with coming to know things, and they're often based in a word like evidence. And if you notice that the base of the word evidence is video, and videos are something that you see, vision. So ultimately what God wants is for us to see him and to know him as he is, because he sees us. So again, as we look for how to know God, we have now seen him, can we follow after him? And what evidences do we have of his love, and can we give evidence out to the world of love? So in your life, if you're feeling confused about anything, get back into where does love begin, and where is there evidence of what's real? Not just what I feel or hope is true, those are, can be good things, but how can I show through love evidence of what God is? And this actually, I think, Tyler, is true about any field of study. If you begin with love and then use good evidence to see God's love expressed through anything that's good, true, or lovely, we can be led aright and not be misguided by misinformation. Amen to that. So if we go to verse 7 now, he says, If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. So he's now saying, look, if, if you if you really know me, then you're going to know my going to know my father. Look at verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? This verse and verse 10 are used frequently in a uh, Trinitarian context to say, see, he, he's teaching this Trinity doctrine here. Look at verse 10, believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, and the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. It feels and sounds very Trinitarian. Now we get into a the theological aspects of Jesus' final teachings here to his apostles, and it's profound. There's this concept in scripture uh, study and teaching called proof texting. What proof texting is, is when you take one or two verses or a small section of scriptures 
and you pull it off of the page, and then you elevate it above everything else and say, see, I've now found the text to prove my point. I'm right, and you're, you're proving that point using a, an isolated set of teachings. And we have to be careful because this doesn't just happen with scriptures. It can also happen with words of the living prophets. It would be very easy to take a sentence or a phrase or one talk and pull it out of all of the other talks and all of the other teachings that have come to us from our inspired leaders and then exalt that one teaching above all the rest and say, okay, see, here's my point, it's proved, and we end up playing doctrinal chess, if we're not careful, in, in Bible bashing or in arguments over doctrine because we're proof texting. So our invitation as we go through here is to read all of the words that John gives us, not just isolate a few verses like that one, because you could see how easy it would be to, to teach that doctrine of the Trinity in that context. Oh, that's funny. It's <laughs> the word I was going to write. So the text, what goes with the text? If you don't have context, the text is just a con. What Tyler is teaching here is that we can't just look at one word or one phrase in isolation. We need to see it in this larger context. Just like you, you are not simply a single action that happens at 10 a.m. on a Monday morning. You are a larger context, and life, it, it, God knows that. And when we eat, offer each other grace and understand where people are coming from and their life context, we also end up not misjudging. And we want to be careful that we truly see the truth that God has provided in the text instead of imposing the meaning we think the text should be telling us. So let's look at the word that he used there repeatedly, in. So you saw that in verse 10, the Father in me, and the Father dwelleth in me. And then verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Okay? Now, we read on. We read all of John's uh, writing here. Verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father, which is an interesting concept. Father dwelleth in me, I dwell in him, but I'm now going to go unto my Father, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And now you get this incredible teaching, starting in verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. I need to just pause here and say, often members of the church will get um, questioned or even at times attacked in, in friendly ways, but, but attacked by people who say, people in your church, you, you believe that you have to do things in order to be saved. We believe we're saved by grace, and, and you have to work your way into heaven. The funny thing about that is, is if you want to proof text certain passages in the Bible, largely from the writings of Paul, you could see how that, that teaching could sound very plausible and, and reasonable. And it is true, we are saved by grace. We are totally saved by grace, but the fascinating aspect is to read the words of Jesus Christ in the Gospels, because Jesus never once uses the phrase, you're saved by my grace, not once. Not once does he even use the Greek word charis, which is grace, in a salvific way. He only ever uses it by saying things like, if you do nice things to those who are kind to you, what what grace is there in that? Is That's the, the way he uses the word grace. And some would say, well, wait, Jesus doesn't ever use the word grace in a salvation way? And the answer is no, not even in the Book of Mormon, 3 Nephi account, does he ever use the word grace. And some would say, well, why not if it's such an important concept? I would suggest that Jesus embodies grace. His giving to us of his commandments and of his love and of his forgiveness and his mercy, he, he is embodying grace. But it doesn't mean that I can just sit back and let him embody grace and then eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow I die as long as I've accepted him. Look at what he says, 
if ye love me, keep my commandments. Are you seeing how this doesn't have to be in opposition to or in competition with grace, that it can actually be the embodiment of his grace, that he's saying, I'm giving you commandments. It's a gift of grace from me that I'm giving you commandments so that you can know how to act, you can know how to talk, you can know what to believe. That's grace. And now, as you struggle to keep those commandments, I will forgive you. That's grace. As you are able to keep those commandments, it's because you've drawn on my power, I'm, I'm enabling you, I'm helping you to keep those commandments. That's grace. It's everywhere in the, these teachings. The fact that he's focusing on his apostles, it's grace. It's all there, even though the Word isn't there. And no, we aren't working our way into heaven. We're striving to come unto Christ. It's our job to come to him with his help, and it's his job to get us to heaven. But let's build on this. We're talking about how to know by loving, and there's a method for doing that. You begin with love so you can know. And Jesus is saying, I've loved you first. Okay, I'm, I'm initiating this relationship. That's the grace. It's freely offered, and I want you to be in relationship with me. I want you to know me, and to do that, you show love by being on the path or the method of keeping commandments, and that is you demonstrating that you're in relationship with me. So look at verse 16. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Are you noticing what's included in verse 16? Jesus is going to pray to the Father that he would give you another comforter to abide with you forever. And then he clarifies, verse 17, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. There's that word again, that in. So this comforter is going to be in you. So our English word comforter comes from the Latin con or con, which means with. We saw that in the word context and fort, fort or places of strength. So what, when we get the Spirit of God, we are given strength to be with us. It's like the word Emmanuel, God with you. And the Greek word is an interesting word. It's parakletos, and it means an advocate, an intercessor, a comforter, a helper, somebody who is close beside. So para or para, think about the word parallel. So paraclete, is from like the word parallel, it's right next door, and cleat comes from the word kalao, which means to call. In fact, the word ecclesiastes means to call out. The original word for church means to be called out. So the comforter is the one who is right next to you when you call out. That's amazing. You're never alone. Never. You might feel alone. All you have to do is call out, and the paraclete or the comforter is already right there with you, strengthening you. What a promise. So verse 18, he goes on to say, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. And now look at verse 20. One of the reasons why we invite people to continually keep reading, don't just stop and proof text one passage of scripture. Read all of it. Let's look for truth and synthesize it from across the scripture canon in the words of all the prophets. He says in verse 20, at that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, there's that in again, and ye in me, and I in you. You could connect verse 20 with verse 10. This concept of what does it mean when he says that the Father's in me and dwelleth in me and I am in the Father, what does he mean? He gives us some more clarification that in that day you'll see and know that he's in the Father and you are in him and he is in you. It's this beautiful oneness. 
It's not this separate nature, it's, or a divided nature, it's a oneness, it's a unified nature. Yeah, we have the word um, atonement, or at-one-ment, the process or outcome of being at one, and I read this as covenantal, that we are now in final and permanent covenantal binding, whereas while we're here in life, we are in covenant with God, but it's potentially transitory based on whether we choose to stay in there. But once we sh we continue to be in that relationship, ultimately, God will seal it and make it permanent so that we are in him and him in us. So he goes on to say, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. You'll notice he didn't say it's anyone who just says, yeah, Jesus is my Savior, they're the ones that love me. He says, no, it's the people who have my commandments and keepeth them. Those are the ones that love me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And then Judas, not Iscariot, so this would be Jude, one of his other apostles, not, not the Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. He's hit this three times now in this one chapter. Just in case anybody missed the, in the case topic. Missed the first two. And it's interesting that he's not simply saying, I declare to you that I want you to simply declare me at all times. Well, it is good to declare the love of God, but it's about doing or it's a very action-oriented. It's not enough to declare that you're a follower of Jesus, to declare that you love God or to declare that you know Jesus or that you're a Christian. He's asking us to show that we are. And these words are so interesting, showing, manifest, seeing. God wants us to give evidence to ourselves, to him and to others, that we are in a relationship. Not just speak it, but actually do the relationship. The purpose of sharing all of this and this concept of proof texting is so that you understand the incredibly powerful foundation of doctrinal uh, teachings that we have in the Church of Jesus Christ, that you don't need to be ashamed of, of the gospel and of the scriptures and of our, the teachings of our living prophets. You're on very, very firm ground relying on the teachings of the Savior Jesus Christ himself when, when you get into these uh, conversations or when people are disagreeing with you about salvation and where it comes from. Simply take them into John 14, 15, 16, 17 and start reading with them the entirety of some of these passages and it becomes very clear what Jesus is telling us to do, not what other people are telling us is required for salvation, but what the Savior himself, the one who's in charge of salvation, the author and the finisher of our faith, is giving us the method, the way, the epistemology, how to think about our journey of discipleship. And it's beautiful if we can clear out all of the weeds of the world and the perspectives and the philosophies that, that come at us from the world and dig down to the roots of what the Savior himself is asking us to do, it's pretty clear. So let's look at the opposite of this, verse 24, he that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So I'm not just making this up, I'm giving you the words that the Father gave to me, and the Father's the one who sent me this, this mission of, of an apostle to be sent. Uh, verse 25, these things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. There are your three members of the Godhead. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. It's such a beautiful beautiful concept here. And now, one of my favorite verses of all scripture, and it becomes even more beautiful when you put it in its context of this Last Supper, and we're, we're a few verses away from leaving the upper room. 
and he turns to his apostles and says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Those words are so sobering because Jesus is doing more than just teaching us his gospel. He's showing us his grace. He's extending his grace, and he's revealing himself. If I ever hope to be in him and have him in me, I need to know what he is like. I need to know his attributes, his characteristics, his perfections, and he's modeling for us in this high, uh, highly anxious moment of his life when, when he could be so turned inward, he becomes even more turned outward and worried about his apostles feeling peace. That is grace embodied in the Savior Jesus Christ, and I want to be more like him. And he's given us, he's given us the blueprints by showing us example after example after example, as well as teaching us the way, teaching us his words. And now it's our job to rely on him to walk that path of discipleship, the covenant path that he's laid out for us. Verse 28, he says, Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. He sets up an inequality here that has been debated through the ages, and it was a serious debate back at the Council of Nicaea between Athanasius and Arius, the Athanasian doctrine that, that the Son was co-equal and uh, co-eternal with the Father, and Arius saying, no, he's, he's less than the Father, and they thought that was heretic, when in reality Arius was – they said he was proof-texting because he was using verses like verse 28 to say, Jesus himself said, the Father is greater than I, and so you get these doctrinal debates. Now, was everything Arius taught accurate? No. Was everything Athanasius taught accurate? No. But they were doing the best they could with, with their perspective of saying, here's the destination, and turns out they were both off for different reasons. I even wonder, okay, so people want to intellectually debate. I wonder if they had taken their time to keep the commandments. I'm sure they were probably good, good guys, but take the time to love their neighbor and to do good in the world. I just wonder, like, what if we just spent more time trying to be like Jesus? As far as we know, we never see Jesus doing these kinds of debates, ever. He's just like, I want you to love God by taking care of those around you. And he was very full of alacrity doing that. And I think sometimes we get into these modes where we want to create us versus them, and, oh, you're not part of my tribe, so you're bad. God's like, no, it's a whole tribe of people who just want to act in love. So I kind of feel sad we have a lot of wasted decades and centuries over debates that probably didn't help us know God better. Yeah, which now brings us to the conclusion of that uh, experience in the upper room. Verse 29, and now I have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. I I've, I've prophesied these things so that when they happen, it will enhance your belief. It'll, it'll make your faith in me even stronger. Verse 30, hereafter I will not talk much with you, and then let's jump down to the Joseph Smith translation footnote. For the prince of, doctor, of darkness, who is of this world, cometh, but hath no power over me, but he hath power over you. That JST footnote is, is sobering. It's that reality, another extension of the Savior's grace. Though the, power, the prince of darkness has no power over the Savior, he's saying, he will have power over you, so you need me because I can overcome him, but you have to invite me in. You have to allow me to give you that strength to overcome the power of the, the, the darkness. And then he finishes with verse 31, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Did you catch it? Back in verse 15, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. 
and now in verse 31 he's telling us, as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Makes you think he probably learned that concept from his Father, saying to him, if you love me, keep my commandments. Not that the Father had to say that, but it's that same concept of Jesus modeling, do the things that you're told or asked to do by the trustworthy person whom you really love, and ultimately the first person you're supposed to love is God with all of your heart, might, mind, and strength, and your whole soul. So Jesus modeled that for us yet again. And now he's sitting there at that supper, it's all finished, his initial teachings are, are complete, and he gives five of the most incredible words that I know of in Scripture. And at first pass you might think, what are you talking about? The words are, arise, let us go hence. And you're thinking, what's so unique about that? Well, you know where hence is going to take them. You know where hence is. It's called Gethsemane. And it's not his apostles saying, okay, Jesus, your moment's come. I know this is going to be really hard, but you've got to do it, so get up, let's go, we'll walk with you. It's not them saying that to him. It's Jesus saying it to them. Arise, let us go hence. I know what I need to do. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be easy, but I'm going to do it because it's a commandment of the Father, and I love the Father, and I'm going to keep a commandment and a covenant that I made with him, and I'm going to fulfill it. He could have stayed in that comfort zone of the upper room for a long time, but he didn't. He's finished. He says, get up, let's go. Brothers and sisters, what an amazing concept for us to follow him in the way, whether that's to go and do really hard things, go on a mission, go into marriage, go into parenthood, go into a new career, go into a, a degree program, go into a new relationship, go into a new church calling, arise, let us go hence. The implication of that is you're not going alone. You're walking with him. Let us go hence was his invitation, once again an extension of his grace. How we love the Lord for his perfect example, for his perfect love, for his perfect grace, and for showing us what it looks like to perfectly keep the commandments and love God with all of his heart, might, mind, and strength, and to love his neighbors as himself. He's the only one who has perfectly embodied these things, and what a joy it is to strive to follow his example and to walk with him in trying to become like him.